What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Real Talk NFT. We got our amazing co-host, Brian, who we all know and love. And today we have a very exciting guest, good friend, actually, because, you know, a crypto analyst from our parent company, Crypto 101. Shout out to the mothership. Also co-founder of DappFuse, which, you know, Matt's going to talk a little bit about. Managing member of a VC fund doing a lot, you know, and we just heard you wrote, you know, $20 million into um, Bowdoin, uh, if if, uh, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, we're, not, we're not allowed to talk about that one. Yeah. <laughs> and lastly, newly, you know, you're on a 10-day contract with the uh, Real Talk NFT, NFT Nation team because you're absolutely crushing the NFT space. And we wanted to bring you on because this, we were seeing so much convergence. And thank you for jumping on so we can just chat about, you know, everything that's going on right now. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm excited to be here. It's It's been fun uh, watching you guys do all this on the side, you know, within our parent company and never had the chance to come on here. So excited to talk about NFTs. We don't get to talk about NFTs very often on, on our side of the fence. Uh, so there's a lot to dive into for sure. Yeah, there's a lot. There might, this might be a part one of 10 because, you know, yeah, you, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's exciting how there's a convergence that I'm seeing at least with uh, crypto and NFTs. NFTs are launching meme coins and then a lot of crypto companies are launching NFTs these days. And yeah, we just wanted to see if there's anything that's in the crypto side that we might be missing out on or could get ahead of in the NFT world. But before we jump into all that, you know, give us the down low really quick how you got into, you know, Web3. Everyone's got a crazy story. And then potentially, you know, yeah. uh, one of the projects that you're co-founding right now. For sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, everyone does have a crazy story. And I, I love asking that question, too, because it's it's always fun to hear how, how everyone sort of converged on this same idea over over time. But uh, my my first foray into crypto was was all the way back in, in 2010. Uh, I, I was just a, a dumb kid on the Internet and uh, wandering through like 4chan and things like that, which uh, I'm not involved oh, yeah. with anymore. So don't. Don't, uh, don't, don't shoot me down for that. Um, but, but, you know, discovered Bitcoin and, and I was, uh, I was a young kid with, with no money and, and, uh, living in the dorms at the time I was in college and, uh, tried to mine Bitcoin with a laptop and I failed. I ruined my laptop and I didn't have any money to fix it. Didn't have any money to buy. So, uh, unfortunately I, I, uh, ruined my chances of generational wealth uh, straight out of the gate. Um, but came back to the industry in about 2015 and, and, uh, you know, that's, that's when I was buying Bitcoin to trade on BitMEX and uh, sort of paying attention to what was going on in the space, but still really just learning. And ever since then, it's it's been kind of a nonstop uh, hobby journey uh, from, from about 2015 up until 2021, where I joined the team here and started doing this professionally. Uh, but for, for about six years there, I was just uh, doing, doing, you know, trading on, on, essentially every waking minute of of my my time that wasn't spent at work or or uh well that that's it i wasn't doing anything social it was just just <laughs> degen trading for for years on end and and uh that it, it helped it built the foundation and and i think you know to this day the people that i talk to that also came in around you know the 15 2015 2016 2017 uh those are the leaders in the space and those are the ones who have founded the projects and and really uh fully integrated themselves into the industry so it's been a long journey but it's been a lot of fun i love being in this space professionally i, I can't imagine uh going back to what i was doing in the past uh, working in finance and things like that so uh definitely uh excited to to dive more into that oh but also want to mention um recently co-founded a project so i went i went from a, a dgen trader all the way to the to the co-founder journey and uh project is called dat fuse we're, we're just in the process of of finishing our software right now. So we're, we're beginning uh, beta testing. Um, so still very early in our journey, but essentially what we do is we, we grab on-chain data and push it into marketing stacks, into advertising uh, stacks, user analytics, things like that. So we can you know allow brands to do everything from uh, tracking customers to finding new customers to uh, well, poaching from other competitors and things like that. So it's it's really just uh, a full suite product to allow. Well, not full suite actually. It's it's a comprehensive data platform that allows us to push uh, Web three data into existing marketing stacks. So a lot of a lot of use cases there, but the industry is still really young, and and we're still you know we being the industry as a whole still trying to find our stride with with you know the maturation of the technology and and dare I say real use cases because uh, a lot of what we have in the space today is really just for for speculation and and for fun I mean you know look at memes we, we're we're definitely gonna have to talk about meme coins and and things like that but 
um, it's it's an exciting time to be a part of the industry, that's for sure. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to keep talking for half an hour straight. <laughs> you went from degen trading to building an actual utility based uh, crypto project. That is exciting. And can you tell us about the twenty million dollar <laughs> Bowden uh, purchase that you made with your uh, uh, VC fund? <laughs> Yeah, we unfortunately we we won't be able to talk about the details of that. Um, yeah, so it's a twenty million dollars short on Bowdoin. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I uh, we, un- unfortunately our our uh, our fund is not allowed to trade meme coins uh, by our own our our own regulation. But um, but man, there is a lot going on there, and and especially in the Solana ecosystem. Uh, personally, I'm a little biased towards base. We can talk about that in a minute, but. But yeah, I've been hearing uh, hearing big news about Bowden and and Whiff and and many of those others in, in the the Solana ecosystem. Yeah, well, we'll touch meme coins fairly soon in, in the crypto world. I mean, we're drowning over here in the NFT world. There's so many projects and and things starting up. I imagine crypto to be ten times more. How did you even find the time, or what kind of gravitated you towards NFTs more so than before? I, I know that prior we talked about NFTs here and there, but it seems like you're you're like diving head first into nfts yeah so so you you've only picked me up uh you picked me up late in the journey i i've been playing around with nfts for years uh definitely got in, involved with it back in you know the the 2020 time 2021 uh made a decent amount of money on on a couple flips and trades but i was also uh one of those people that would buy something for for what it looked like and i would hold it you know and, and really round trip things uh throughout the market and and what I took away from that that initial experience dipping into NFTs was the the culture side of it, you know. And it, there is that aspect of of community to it. And I think community is one of those words that that a lot of projects like to throw around uh, as as a necessary part of of their tokenomics or or their you know ecosystem or anything like that. But but you know, let's not kid ourselves. Uniswap does not have a community. Ave doesn't have a community. Maker doesn't have a community. These are holders. These are investors, if you want to call it that, and and they're members of of a, a DAO, which is a company. NFTs are are the other side of that. It is a lot more focused on on the culture and the the vibes, I guess. You know, it's it, you don't have meetups for people that hold a token, uh, but you do have meetups for for people that hold NFTs, and, and I think that aspect of it is is drastically different from the highly financialized side of you know the crypto side of of the industry so so there's an attraction from from the emotional side you know it's it is it's it's finding your tribe it's finding people who who uh are there for for the art but also understand the technology so so i think that was probably the the entry for it for me was was understanding the technology on the token side and then starting to get into some of these these groups and these um, uh, ecosystems, I suppose, or or communities is, is the right word. You know, getting involved with those communities is is the sticking point, and and that's what would encourage me to 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 stick around. But but that said, you know, from from the perspective of the last couple of years, NFTs have been a rough game, and and it's been really hard to to be profitable there, and. And let's not kid ourselves. We're you know culture's fun and all, but but we're here to make money as traders, and and so ultimately it, it was a hard space to be in. I, I more power to you guys for for sticking through the the bear market. Not that we had it any better on the crypto side, but uh, it, it's definitely been a, a rough couple of years. That said, now that we have the resurgence of activity in the space, we're seeing these communities come back to life. You know, like. Uh, Joe, you got me involved in in on chain monkeys, and that's something that I had heard of and and sort of you know recognized in the past. Especially going to conferences, you see like, oh, this event is hosted by OCM, or or this is for OCM holders only, and it's like, yeah, that's cool. They they got their own little space. Um, but once I started, you know, once I bought one and and have access to the to the holder chat, it's like, wow, this is this is incredible. It's just a wealth of information, and and it really is. Uh, it's kind of like walking into a room and seeing like, oh, this is where all the cool kids are hanging out, you know. So, so it's it, it that's uh, that to me is is I think uh, again the sticking point for for NFTs. It was it was you know I was attracted by the <clears throat> potential gains and the potential returns of of uh, seemingly quick flip, uh, but stayed for the culture. So, 
it's uh I, I I think my NFT journey is just starting. I don't know if I'll I'll uh, switch teams entirely, but <laughs> but I'm definitely here for for this cycle. Awesome. Well, both sides are always fun. Crypto NFTs, and they seem to be definitely coming together. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago it was definitely like the NFT world and crypto world, but we're seeing a lot of projects incorporate a lot of the same ideas and thought processes of a lot of these coins. Going back to what you originally said, because Joe and I have been talking for. Uh, a few weeks now about Ethereum, the the mainnet versus Solana and how we were just sick of paying high gas fees on Ethereum, but that was where majority yeah. of high end NFTs were. And we just all kind of like paid the high gas fees because that's where the liquidity was. That's where the attention was. And then we saw this move over to Solana and the Solana meme coin game. And that's been crazy. And now we're seeing this action on base and we're, we're super excited about base, but you made a call out that you're biased between Solana and base. And maybe this is a perfect time to bring that up because Solana's network is struggling to, to work right now, to put it, uh, to be frank. Yeah. So just curious about from a crypto expert, the difference between the two networks and why you lean, and I'm going to assume you lean a little bit more towards base over Solana. Yeah. So, so it's a good question. From, from a technical standpoint, I understand Ethereum and EVM chains way more than anything else. And so I, I can't really speak to the, the, the technical differences between Solana and Ethereum. The way I've always looked at Solana is that I was always too late. And, and so to some degree, you know, I looked at, I, I had a position in Solana during the last cycle, made, made a couple of bucks, sold it too early, like we were talking about earlier. And, um, you know, ever since then, I kind of never looked back and, and felt like I missed out to some degree. <clears throat> and then as we went through the bear market and the fallout with uh, Three Arrows Capital and FTX and everything, to me, Solana was was tainted and it had a bad name just by association. And I think that was the case for a lot of people. Um, that said, many folks made a lot of money by, uh, you know, inversing that trade and and buying when Solana was in the low double digits, you know, $10 or $12 or whatever it got down to, I think maybe even below 10. Um, that again is something that, that I missed out on. And from the perspective of, of a crypto trader and, and, you know, that's what I I've been doing for long enough to kind of have uh, at least be able to rely on my gut feeling. Um, I looked at Solana in the last couple months and said, you know, I'm, I'm too late to that party. It's already pretty frothy. It's sure. You could probably make some gains there, but the most money has already been made by the people who were there eight months ago. And now it's just, you know, the ultimate PVP. You're just competing against others to, to you know, turn a profit and exit the fastest. So I felt like that wasn't the right place to re-enter the market. Uh, and by re-enter, I mean, for the past couple of years, I've been, you know, holding stables and holding ETH and holding Bitcoin. So moving back into the risk spectrum, uh, relatively recently, Solana felt too late. But at the same time, we saw a ton of activity taking place on the base network. And for someone like me, who's been mostly EVM native for a long time, and and I, I denominate most of my trades in, in ETH primarily, I'm, I'm trying to stack ETH. Yeah. And because of that, I already had a, a healthy supply of ETH. And it turns out it's really, really easy to bridge into the base network. And so combining you know the fact that the base network was from a technological standpoint robust and and growing and also relatively underappreciated by the market because all the attention was paid on Solana i felt like that was you know uh, about a month ago frankly a few months ago would have been the right time to get into base but a month and change ago was was pretty much the last you know last call before the train took off um, that said, it is still pretty early within the base ecosystem. And I always cr uh, cringe a little bit saying, oh, we're still early because it doesn't really feel like we're that early anymore. Um, but at the same time, there is a lot of, of future activity that, that could come into the base ecosystem, largely just because of their association with Coinbase and the fact that Coinbase is launching their, their smart wallet in the near future that, that should allow for, you know, full account abstraction. So People don't need to worry about seed phrases. They don't need to worry about paying transaction fees because it's all done for you. So I I understand that Solana 
already has a lot of those advantages for their users in the way that, you know, the fees are super low. The user interface is, is pretty good. Um, you know, I've done some swaps through Phantom and, uh, or through the Phantom wallet, uh, I guess through like Radium and Orca and, and things like that. Um, I, I just didn't really see the, the profound advantage from a user's perspective. So, excuse me. But on the other hand, I, I do think that, you know, the way that Coinbase is positioning their wallet for EVM networks and the way that they're tied to the base network, it does seem like the logical next narrative for, for capital capital to move into. So, so I, going back to, to your question, Brian, I, I feel like it's not as much, <clears throat> it's not as much looking at the two networks from a technical perspective. It's more so saying that, you know, the, the, the hype cycle has not maybe not run its course in Solana, but it is a lot further into the game than than many other ecosystems are when it comes to uh, attracting attention with you know things like meme coins. So so I think ultimately if you know if you're looking for those early earlier opportunities, the base rotation is playing out live. We don't know how long it'll last, but for now that that is the right place to go for you know essentially the best opportunities, but. But again, who knows how long that'll last? You know, we, we might be having this conversation in a month and it's like, oh, look at the near ecosystem and look at the avalanche ecosystem or, or polygon, you know, who knows? But um, but for now, that that is where where capital seems to be flowing. So it's an exciting time to be a base trader. Uh, but but it is, you know, there's still a lot of kinks to work out. It is still not completely user friendly because you do still need to manage your seed phrase and you still have to yeah. uh, pay for transactions. And And, you know, if you receive an airdrop of something, uh, you never know if it's uh, legitimate or if it's a scam, and and by approving that, you might compromise your wallet. And so, a uh, lot of lot of little speed bumps t- still to contend with, and and it's going to cause, um, well, I was going to say it's cause going to cause some problems. It already more or less has. Maybe the right way to look at it is there are still a lot of problems to solve for developers in that ecosystem. So it's still growing. It's it's still maturing. And uh, I think because of that, it's it's the right time to get involved for opportunities, especially NFTs. I mean, you know, base NFTs, we, we've been talking about that a little bit internally, um, but there's there's a lot going on there too. Like you guys want to get into into the to the base stuff too? Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, why not? Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, well, where, where to start, you know, cause we've been talking about it a bunch, um, swatches, I guess is, is the big one, you know, it's, uh, the swatches, uh, um, NFT, uh, it's, it's essentially digital art, interactive art. And a lot of people are comparing it to, uh, squiggles, which I, the crummy squiggles, which I see, uh, you got one on your wall back there that, you know, that could be a big thing. And, and it's, it's hard to say if, if, uh, swatches are really going to take off and, and be the, you know, the chromey squiggles of base network. Um, but it's, it, it is checking a lot of boxes from the perspective of, of the holder base and, and the, the provenance of it. And, and I think that I was going to say innovation. I don't know if it's innovative as much as it is just uh, being a first mover within the ecosystem to have a, an interactive, you know, NFT, especially for, for PFPs. So that's just one of many. I mean, you know, what, what are what are some of the other ones that that we were? Uh, the gentleman is a <laughs> DJ uh, coin is a big meme coin on on base, and someone started a, a DJ gentleman NFT profile picture collection. Uh, I'm not sure if it's <laughs> with the same founders as a meme token. You tell me. Uh, that's a good question, actually. No, yeah, it's it, it's not. Yeah, inspired by, but but yeah, that's another one. You know that that one could be uh, interesting as well as D D gentleman. Um, just from the perspective of of the the 10k PFP that that might provide utility and and um, might have airdrops and partnerships and things like that, but that's maybe maybe to zoom out a little bit within base. That's I, I think that kind of illustrates where the the industry is because you know I mentioned OCM earlier on, on Chain Monkeys and that's that's an ecosystem that's been around for what three years yeah. or so. It's it's well developed, yeah. you know, and they they have they have the whole community and they have kind of a, a vibe to the place. You know, they, they have a way of doing business or in other words, they're, they're established, but, but we don't have that at all in base network. You know, there are some artists that have come over from, from other ecosystems and begun to, 
make their mark or or suggest that they're going to do something soon but but ultimately all of these projects are so new that it's it's so hard to pick a winner but but yeah de gentleman is an interesting one i think swatches is going to be a big one um man there's, how, there's how a third on, one how about on how about on chain guys i know i know you were super Very, early oh, in that yeah. project i've been watching it since like 0.2 0.3 ethereum with some people who recommended it to me and i've just watched it climb up almost to two eth and they made some big yeah. announcements. I, I think it might have been over the weekend, but if you don't mind kind of touching base on why you were bullish on that so early and exactly what is it? Yeah, so good question. Um, to answer what is it, uh, we don't know yet. There, <laughs> There is some amount of information that's been uh, released, but we understand that, that it will be a PFP. It's it's uh, The artwork is being created by uh, an artist called Anton Marisette or something like that. Don't quote me yeah. on, on the last name. Um, and, and you know, we've seen previews of it and it looks really cool. And, and so that, I guess, what attracted me to the on-chain Gaia specifically was the fact that it was airdropped or it was a free mint for people who had been on Farcaster uh, and, and had minted out, I think, seven different frames. Uh, for those that are not on Farcaster yet, um, frames are, are a implementation within the feed that allows you to interact with something else outside of the main news feed. So think of, you know, if, if OpenSea had a way to, to mint something directly on Twitter, that's essentially what a frame is. Um, so for the people that interacted with these frames over the course of, I think, two months or something like that, or a month and a half, uh, if you had minted each one of these and held all of them, you were eligible to, to free mint this on-chain Gaia that was supposed to be essentially a, a PFP. And I looked at that and said, okay, from the perspective of the holders, you know, for one, all these people that got these got them for free. So there isn't, there isn't that the risk of, um, or there isn't the overhead, I suppose, of people investing, you know, one ETH to, to, to yeah. mint this or something like, this. well, no one, no one mints for one ETH, but even then, you know, say 0.1, um, if it was 0.1 ETH, then, you know, there's going to be a lot of buying and selling or a lot of selling, especially from, from the minters to, to, you know, either take profits or try to flip it or anything like that. Uh, that wasn't the case for this one. And, and so that aspect of it was, was valuable. There was essentially, it was in price discovery mode. So from the time it was released, from the time you could buy it on secondary, it was, it was all upside from there. Um, so the parallel to that is you know, within the crypto space is, is buying a brand new token versus buying something that's been out for a couple of years and has uh, a large holder base of probably bag holders if, if that project hasn't hit an all-time high yet. So that perspective, just from, from the, maybe the technical analyst uh, side of it was, was valuable. Um, the other side though, is, is who those people were. These were all people who were early in Farcaster, which uh, has been a hotbed of 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 kind of alpha, I suppose. Uh, really, all the all the ins uh, the industry insiders made their way to Farcaster first, and and so it's become um, kind of that <laughs> that closed group that everyone jokes about, like oh the you know the cabal is out there planning, and that's kind of what Farcaster is. Uh, maybe not as much anymore with with a half million users, um, but as recently as a month ago, that number was half that. So. Again, yeah. it's, you know, those, the holders of the on-chain Gaia uh, were people that had conviction in the industry in general, and they were probably people who didn't need that 0.2 ETH, you know, and, and there was no reason to, to just be selling that for 0.2. So, um, so personally, I bought one at about 0.2. And, and that's, that's when, you know, I, I kind of saw that, okay, this has had enough traction now. Um, it looks like, you know, it, it, essentially it's checking all the boxes of, of what I would look for in a crypto project. In, in other words, uh, held by power users, uh, full upside potential and, and seemingly, you know, strong provenance from, from a technical standpoint. So, uh, again, so it checked all those boxes and, and, um, I, I hold two of them personally. I bought one at, at 0.2 and then at, you know, 3X. I was like, okay, I guess I got to get another one. Double down on your winners, uh, <laughs> folks. That's the, the lesson of the day. Um, but but yeah, happy to happy to report that now they're sitting at about 1.5. So I, I'm, I'm going to hold those through. I think the the PFP reveal is is coming up in, in, in a week or so. And um, we'll, we'll see, you know, what, what happens with that. But the other side of it too is that they're sort of detailing this idea that 
your your Gaia. Uh, I believe it stands for generalized uh, generalized artificial intelligent agent, or maybe it's not generalized. Either way, um, mm-hmm. the goal of this is is to create essentially an NFT that mines you know assets or or is yield bearing in in some degree. So. I don't know yet what that's going to look like. They, they just released this information about two days ago. And, and even then, it is it is a little bit vague still. So they're kind of stringing us along. Um, but it is absolutely something to pay attention to, largely just because of, of the the brief history behind it and, and you know, essentially who's holding it. Uh, I think maybe the last thing to mention, too, is that it's, it's one of those assets where if you hold it in your wallet and you are on Farcaster, uh, you're given access to a, a token gated group, which is pretty much all OGs because that's who's you know holding these assets. So that alone is is worth it um, because for all the even though Farcaster has a pretty high signal to noise ratio, um, the deeper you can go into these uh, OG channels, the the better those signals get. So 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 again, that's 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 worth a. Uh, worth the price of admission by itself maybe not as much at one one and a half ETH, but uh, it was at point two that's for sure yeah i'm excited about but, but yeah and then what was yeah for sure i mean there's there's a lot to love on on the network and and it's growing fast yeah but i see it as what, what was a, the other which one? Oh, i thought i thought brian mentioned another one on chain guys and there was there was a second part to that question but it, it'll come back to me i'll i'll, I'll let you finish your thought yeah, no, the thought is me and Brian both came from Ethereum maximalist mindset, or at least I speak for myself. And I'm glad to see that at least on base, which is not a derivative of, you know, Ethereum, uh, however, is a L2, right? It's not, it's not an L2 exactly, is it? It is. It is. It is a layer yeah. two to Ethereum. It's based on the Optimism uh, code base. So it was essentially forked from Optimism. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to see that, you know, NFTs are still alive and kicking on, you know, the layer two of, of Ethereum artists going on there you know and nft collections really popping off because that's not really happening on the l1 right now on ethereum it's kind of quiet over there yeah yeah and glad to see it happening in base uh, so i'm super excited to dive more into it because the transaction fees are so low pennies compared to on ethereum yeah. trying to buy something me and brian wow. were just talking about this back in 2021 i mean the highest i've seen for someone pay for a, a, a transaction was like ten thousand dollars for a transaction fee <laughs> and wow. Yeah. Well, they got the last lap because they made like $60,000 off that transaction, but it was just it was insane. Whereas yeah. in, in here in base, it's a, it's a lot better, a lot more uh, attainable for, for most people. Uh, that's nuts. Yeah. I, you know, and I did see the, the fees on base um, have been a little bit higher than, than we expected. You know, about uh, when, when 4844 was, was launched, um, what, two weeks ago or, or whatever, uh, the the fees dropped down to you know it, it was about two dollars for a transaction fee on base and it dropped down to about two cents. Uh, now they're kind of creeping back up a little <laughs> bit as more and more people are are coming to the network. So um, if anything, it just indicates that that uh, the the onboarding is still you know happening. But but man, yeah, there's there's going to be a lot of opportunities in in base you know moving forward. And I think um, one thing I, I should have mentioned with swatches earlier when we were talking about that. Uh, there was a, a 10 ETH sale for one of the swatches. Uh, right. It was the the base swatch, I guess. Uh, for those that are familiar, it looks like the base logo. And that was the highest NFT sale ever on mm. any L2. Uh, and and oh, subsequently, oh. you know, the highest ever on, on base. So nice. that, you know, I think that's one more kind of feather in the cap for swatches uh, as, as kind of, you know, proving itself as, as long-term viable, but also that there's probably a lot of upside there. Um, but I think it also illustrates that, you know, <laughs> we've had L2s for, for quite a while, at least a couple of years. Yeah. And for us to finally get that, you know, that double digit ETH sale uh, for the first time, and it happened on base, I, I think speaks to the credibility of that network as well. So, so yeah, ton of stuff to talk about there, but but man, there's a I, we are gonna have to do multiple episodes because I think yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna have to come back and talk about that. Yeah, but Wait, but we, we need we got to move on to ordinals though. <laughs> we ha- we have to move on to this thing. Well, I appreciate your outsiders view in because you use a word a lot that I appreciate. It's called discovery. You're like, oh, we're in price discovery now, and I I've never heard that in an NFT world. You know, as an, with an analyst mind looking into it. But before we jump into ordinals, are you more of a technical analysis, like notice technical analysis and fundamental 
you know, traders, are you are you kind of like a hodgepodge of both or you kind of steer more towards one side, like technical or fundamental news? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I started off as a technical trader. And what I found is is that I got uh, worked by uh, market manipulators frequently. And so uh, I've yeah. I kind of stepped. Yeah. You know, from from like, oh, you see this pattern. It's like that pattern is very tradable, but it turns out it was a trap. Um, <laughs> because of that, it, learning over the years of trading, uh, what, what I, I, I've stepped back a little bit and I only trade things that I've already done fundamental analysis on. So I, I gate my portfolio by diving into the details. I want to know everything from, you know, how long has this project been around to who's their backers? Uh, if any, who's their team? What have they done in the past? I, I go through the whole gamut of, uh, you know, a checklist to make sure that something's viable. And if it passes that, then I'll start doing technical analysis to look for entry and exit points. But I, there isn't one one right way to do it because if you're all fundamental, you're going to miss out on uh, a lot of of important, you know, triggers like volume, for example. Uh, if you're not yeah. a, if you're not trading based on on volume. Um, you, you could end up sitting in a position for six months before it does anything. So, you know, you need to be able to use the technical side, um, but you also need to understand that that you can't just go out and trade anything. Well, maybe you can these days with all the meme coins, but uh, <laughs> when, when, when everything's pumping, you can just trade anything. Um, but but when it comes to risk management, the, the fundamental analysis is, is incredibly important. Yeah, we, we definitely utilize you know some of those aspects here I, I know you mentioned technical analysis on nfts when we first talked about nfts like a few weeks ago you're like yeah i'm just trading on an analytics here and you look like a pretty good entry i was like, oh that's a good way to look at it because i never look at it that way so it's good to have an outsider's view and, and one thing i want your view on is all these different chains you mentioned soul you mentioned base i know one that's really popping off on everyone's radar right now is bitcoin and ordinals and the meme meme coin 2.0 that's coming up during the halving and just wanted your your sky high view of you know how it all kind of differs. You know, there's no really art art artists or artwork NFTs on Solana, and base memes has kind of taken off. And you being kind of new, I would say to base and to possibly Bitcoin NFTs. You know, what what do you see is like the major differences in each of the uh, these chains? You know, uh, when we talk in NFT world, uh, they know that there's a different vibe for Ethereum heads and different vibe for Soul heads and base and, and bitcoin ordinals so i just kind of wanted to see your looking for i don't think we ever asked this question to anybody uh so this would be a good question mm. to kind of overview for us also I, you know i never i never thought about that at all but but now that you ask there there is a profound difference between each one of these ecosystems um that said i have not spent a lot of time outside of uh, ethereum base and bitcoin um i've dabbled just a little bit in in some nfts on you know arbitrum and and uh maybe one on solana a long time ago um but i only put that out there to say that that my my experience is a little bit limited so i'll focus on the, the three that i know uh, base ethereum and, and bitcoin um what i've seen is that ethereum is a mature landscape more or less there there are already winners that have been uh minted uh, identified. There's big communities. You know, you look at Board Apes, which have have kind of uh, sort of struggled lately. But at the end of the day, it is it's. I mean, it's an international brand. It's it is recognizable uh, across the world. And then you have um, Pudgy Penguins, right? Is that on Ethereum or yeah. is that Solana? Ethereum. That's Ethereum. That's yeah. So so I think yeah. So so. Those are, you know, two of, of many of these these ecosystems or, or maybe communities within the Ethereum ecosystem that are well established. And because you have so many of these that are very well established, I think it's it's practically impossible for a newcomer uh, in those space, not only from an attention standpoint. Um, but but also from the perspective of, of you know, fees in, in the Ethereum space, uh, traders just don't want to pay nft fees to to mint or to, to move or anything like that especially like even now it's it's relatively high and the market hasn't even fully heated up yet um but i wouldn't be surprised at all if we saw five hundred thousand dollar fees just to mint um and that's without gas wars so so i think ethereum is a bit beyond the place where i 
I would want to be, you know, starting new. It's not where, like, if you're a brand new NFT trader, you could probably skip Ethereum. Um, not financial advice. Probably going to, I'm probably going to regret that. I'm sure something's going to come out tomorrow that's going to be like the <laughs> ultimate trade and, on, on Ethereum. Um, but that's how I look at it. So on the other hand, base is the oasis in a desert for all of those people who who feel like they're priced out of ethereum or they feel like they missed the boat on ethereum um and i say that because the base ecosystem hasn't we don't have any winners yet there there aren't i said we uh, i've spent so much time in that ecosystem <laughs> i identify with it now um, <laughs> so so there aren't any there aren't any clear winners in in the base ecosystem yet because none of these projects are old enough to establish uh really a, a robust community mm-hmm. or or have a a dedicated goal or a mission or anything like that. So I, I think we're starting to see the beginnings of that. I, I think Swatches is a great example of, of you know, pioneering the the art space within base. And I think um, in, in due time, we're probably going to see a lot of copycats and a lot of derivatives from, you know, the Swatches work. Uh, but that's only one example of, of, you know, hundreds of projects that already exist on base that just haven't really <clears throat> established their footprint yet. Um, that said, from looking at like the culture of the base ecosystem, it, it, it does feel a lot more like um, my one of my favorite ways to, to make this example is like when I moved, when I went to college and I moved into the dorms uh, my freshman year, you're in a building of a, with 100 other people that are all in the exact same place. They're all uh, no one has any friends yet. Everyone has, you know, bright eyes, bushy tails, ready to to kind of make the most of themselves, reinvent themselves, anything like that. That's how base feels right now. It feels like this this world where everyone's just really excited to be there. Everyone is looking for like the next friend to make, the next connection, the next thing to learn. But it, it it's mostly a level playing field. So you don't have, for the most part, you don't have these, you know, power users who prevent everyone else from participating on, on a level field. Uh, and, and so I think base feels the most organic right now uh, of the three of those. It, it doesn't feel forced. It just feels like everyone's there to kind of have a good time and, and be a part of, of this growing ecosystem. Uh, lastly, Bitcoin feels like the complete opposite of that. So Bitcoin feels like uh, we, ha- we have no other goal in mind besides making money. These are all people who have been here for a long time uh, and, and arguably the longest of, of anyone else. And so there's, there are people in there who, you know, you're not competing against someone for a whitelist spot. You're competing against someone who runs a Bitcoin node, who knows how to inscribe ordinals. They're, they're the ones, you know, sniping your transaction from Magic right. Eden because they can front run you with their own node. So that is a completely different, uh, vibe, I guess, to, to the, to the trader uh <laughs> journey um because you're you're competing against the the people who who are probably the best in the industry uh when it comes to you know trying to secure an nft or trying to get on a whitelist or or anything like that so that can be tough for for uh newbies you know for for those that are just trying to get into this uh into nft trading or, or even just learn about it um, I've been in the space for, for more than a decade and I, I feel completely lost every time I start reading about, you know, ordinals, the, the technical side of it and, and the upcoming runes protocol, you know, r- trying to wrap my head around that has been, um, it's been invigorating, but, but man, I've never felt so dumb within the industry that I've, I've spent, you know, a third of my life in. Uh, and, and so the, the barriers to entry in Bitcoin are a lot higher. And then on top of that, because it's so heavily financialized, what I've seen so far with ordinals projects is if they're not delivering value very consistently, they're done. You know, people stop paying attention to them uh, because there's, you know, even if the artwork is cool and even if, you know, the, the community is awesome, it's like, we got better things to spend our money on right now because the having is imminent. You know, the runes protocol is, is coming right around the corner. We're, we're what 12 days away or 11 days away from, from that launching. And because of that, it's just, uh, the community over there is nothing but sharks, which if you can keep up, you know, that's, that, there's a ton of opportunity there, but it's uh, not for the faint of heart and not for the undercapitalized, put it that way. So I, I think uh, of the three, um, I'm most bullish on 
returns from ordinals. I think I think if you're positioned in, in ordinals, you're you're probably going to see the highest upside there. Um, that said, I'm most excited to participate in the base ecosystem because that's where the culture is. That's that's the aspect of NFTs that attracted me to NFTs is is the community and and being a part of that from a very early stage is is appealing. And so so again, I, I think uh, for anyone listening to this, looking for you know if you're going to choose one to really dive full into, uh, it, w- it would be base from my perspective. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point and very similar views. It feels like the Bitcoin ecosystem is just a little bit more sophisticated at the end of the day. That's a good and way to put it. I, I, yeah, I, f- I feel the same way. Every time I'm like digging into ordinals and I, I own quite a few ordinals, I'm down the rabbit hole with both of you with runes and rune stones and what's this going to be in 10, 11 days. And I'm, you know, getting yeah. prepared and trying to get as much information, as digest as much information as I can. And I come up for a breath of fresh air and I'm just like, what did I just, what did I just review? And I asked Joe, I'm like, Hey, explain this to me like I'm a fifth grader. And he's like, yeah, I'm trying to figure it out too. I'm like, okay, great. Yeah. But I, I, I agree that ordinals feels like with the having and just with the bullishness on Bitcoin and it kind of being the legacy blockchain, I do think we're going to see some of those top projects run and it's amazing to me personally because I always I was such an ETH maxi for so long with NFTs. It's amazing to me. I was like, well, those those ETH NFTs, those gold standard NFTs, you're never going to lose that. Now I'm kind of like, oh man, it, it it feels like it, it. A lot of that attention moved over to Bitcoin, and I, I I've placed my bets accordingly as well. I still hold a ton of ETH mainnet NFTs. I'm a big believer's in, but. I've also sold a lot of them to get a node monkey and, you know, rune stones and just be involved in that whole area. And I couldn't agree more if just somebody's dipping their toes in right now to get into NFTs and they want to like start minting and exploring and be involved with communities really feels like the base network. It's where it's at. There's not a lot of established projects. I mean, what did we run off? Three of them here, you know, that we thought were promising and there's going to be a lot more to come. Uh, not really a question, just kind of my own personal thoughts. Joe, yeah. what are your thoughts on on those blockchains and your personal opinion? Yeah, I, I like the saying when we had a guest on who said that every blockchain has a different purpose for you know whoever the user may be. You know, so is great for meme coins as we saw this last cycle. Uh, we joke about Bowden a lot on this on this podcast, but Bowden's on Solana and they move a lot of volume. Uh, and we saw the, the small inklings of how much volume they can move when an influencer showed, you know, a Bitcoin meme coin and an NFT project called Pups recently. It went up like a thousand percent because the soul people control the memes. So right now, soul controls the memes. Uh, but Brett has some good memes too. So uh, yeah, it, and and I say that because you know I'm not saying Solana is only for meme coins. You know, don't hate on me. I own a lot of Solana NFTs. Uh, but if you want provenance, if you want art inscribed forever, right, you don't care about IPFS and, and things going down and you want art for the sake of art, that's kind of where Bitcoin holds that supremacy because it's inscribed into the blockchain. It's not on a server somewhere. It is on a server, but a decentralized server. And then for base, you know, I see that kind of like, you know, a, a new playing ground for Ethereum because Ethereum has a lot of issues that you know, it couldn't solve or, or it, it loses a lot of adopters. There's only OG heads there who don't mind paying $40 transaction fees, right? So, yeah, I think there's a place for everyone, whoever wants to play and, and whoever wants to, you know, go art, go in provenance, go to Bitcoin, whoever wants, um, you know, just to degen, go into, you know, Solana for a little bit, play. So there's something for everybody. I'm in all of them. So, and I'm pretty bullish on Bitcoin just as of late. That's where kind of the meta is right now. Uh, so that's why I, I like Matt's perspective coming in as a, um, not a newbie in NFT land, but, you know, as a trader and more, collecting more and more NFTs recently, you know, kind of where, where he feels, what he, what's his views on, on different blockchains. So I feel like there's a place for every blockchain. Yeah. You know, I, I, and I wonder what, because we, we talk about Bitcoin in the context of, of the having coming up and, and runes coming out and things like that. Um, I do wonder how a lot of those pro- projects are going to fare after that catalyst is gone. Uh, because it, you know the hyper hyper competitiveness of that ecosystem suggests that there's going to be a lot of profit taking uh, right around that time, and and I wonder what the longevity of of some of these projects are that you know 
you mentioned like if you want art for the long term by by the ordinals that said the art on ordinals for the <laughs> most part is pretty bland you know it yeah. just it's yeah. it's pixelated or it's something very simple um with with a few exceptions i mean i think the rune whisperers project uh that came out on ordinals recently uh does have really cool artwork um that said the art itself is not on chain right. uh, there is a, a small version of it but the high quality art is not on chain and so you know there there's that aspect of it it doesn't necessarily um appeal to collectors in the same way that right. that i think ethereum does and and in tandem I, I think the base will but but remains to be seen i i think it'll be it'll be interesting to see how it plays out i'm definitely going to be taking some profits on on ordinal exposure um right around the date of the halving but i you know crossing my fingers that that i'll regret that so <laughs> that's the the best place to be is is regretting a sale i think well as long as you still have another one <laughs> yeah in in regards to art on uh bitcoin the bitcoin puppet people are going to be coming after you after this podcast is released by you know Good. that's some high Good. high, <laughs> high yeah. end art there my friend but they are they are fun Send pfps I, I i will certainly give them that i can spot a bitcoin puppet pfp on twitter from a mile away i feel like it's very recognizable so that's that's something to be said that's but true. from from a quality perspective, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna have anybody outside my house with pitchforks. I'm just gonna leave it at that. <laughs> you know, and uh, I'll I'll take the heat for that. And and also, if you're a fan of, of Ripple and Cardano, yeah, you guys you guys uh, can all be grouped together. Right? Yeah, send send them my way. I'll, I'll fight you all. <laughs> no. But uh, but yeah, it, it's funny because I I think the um. What is it? The puppets? Is, is that what they're called? Bitcoin puppets? Bit, yeah, yeah. So Bitcoin I think, puppets. I think that's a, yeah, that's a great example where like personally I saw those a long time ago and I faded them. So I was like, that looks ridiculous. Like who, who need, who wants to buy that? Like surely this must be, you know, as a joke. And, and I didn't look into anything behind the scenes, you know, what they were actually trying to do and, and who was behind it and what the community looked like. And and again, I think that's a great illustration of of how powerful all the other aspects are. Like, don't just look at something and think that looks stupid, because a lot of them do look stupid. But it turns <laughs> out it's it's uh you know a lot of them are, are really powerful just holding the, the token itself. So it, what a what a crazy world. I yeah. mean, I, I'm I feel like I've been around in the NFT space for a long time, um, but you guys are so far beyond me in terms of expertise, and I, I learn a lot from you guys all the time. Um, but man, I just learned a lot from from just participating. It's it's uh, it's it, it's kind of it's fun to feel like a like a newcomer again. So it's keeping me young, <laughs> keeping me uh, invigorated. <laughs> yeah, that's why I love NFTs for the same reason. I saw it as just a more fun aspect of not that crypto isn't. You know, crypto's financialized. So is NFTs financialized. But definitely a lot of fun, and we have a lot of fun here. And we would definitely love to have you back because we definitely need a part, you know, two, three, four, five to talk about a lot of things we didn't talk about. You know, there's a lot of stuff coming up yeah. in crypto that, you know, I hope or, or, you know, would like your insight on how that's going to rotate over into the NFT world. Um, but before we wrap things up, you know, how can people find you? How I Give a shout out to, you know, your handles, Twitter and socials, whatnot, if you want people to find you, that is. Yeah, for sure. I uh, appreciate that. Um, I, I would say find me on LinkedIn. Uh, that would be the best route. Uh, my my handle there is just Matt Polvey. Um, I do have various social media. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as well. It's just at Matt Polvey or at M Polvey, I believe, uh, one or the other. But I'm the only Matt Polvey out there, so so you'll find me. Um, but otherwise, I do not spend a lot of, a lot of time on social media. Um, I do have a Farcaster account, but I'm remaining anonymous through that account for now. So. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But um, but for any, if, if there's any teams, uh, brands, companies out there that, that's looking for a, a solution for, for sourcing on-chain data, um, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. Check out our website too, uh, dapfuse.com. And i um, looking forward to, to connecting with anyone who's looking for a, a data solution for you know marketing, ad, uh, advertising, attribution, all the above. Awesome. Well, Matt pleasure we're gonna talk right after this and we'd love to have you back soon so um we'll we'll, we'll talk to you on the next one awesome sounds great yeah thanks guys